Well, hello out there in the world on whichever platform you're maybe watching watching this on. I'm broadcasting live session three of the Up the Up the Rebels Songs of Resistance um, broadcasts that I've been doing intermittently, um, which I'll be collecting together on the web somewhere coherent eventually. But um, each one is a concert sort of thing um, uh, where I specifically focus on events historically um, that have involved resistance and um, rather than just songs where terrible things happen and lots of people die which is a thing that you know a lot of us write songs about a lot which is also important to remember these events but uh, I, the, there, uh, there is the whole history of resistance in its many different wonderful and terrible and um you know in between and whatever you know and it's in its many different contradictory and and forms um and uh and resistance um in in its many forms can accomplish great things uh, or can seem to accomplish uh, something or uh, or can can accomplish a lot without seeming to accomplish anything. There's a lot of different. I mean, there's so many different eventualities aside from uh, you know the revolution wins and and the the workers are victorious and you know that that, that happens too. But uh, there's a whole lot of other things that happen um, that have a profound impact on history and and human society development and all sorts of things. Um, that are maybe you know a little less obvious or a little more subtle or a little more complex um of course those who are the ones who are most going to be impacted in a in a way by by various forms of resistance such as the ruling class um in a negative way perhaps uh, will try to um, downplay the resistance and say, well, we're not paying attention to those protesters. They're really having no impact on us. You know, just continue as you were. And, you know, nobody's really paying attention. And, um, you know, this is the message they want to communicate. Uh, but, of course, uh, resistance <clears throat> actually has all sorts of uh, massive positive impacts, as, you, you know, anybody who's watched the last couple episodes uh, would be aware of in many different examples and um uh you know and uh, it probably if you if you're into social movement history you 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 know lots of, of other examples and i'll cover some more of them um today and i can see uh comments if you're watching on twitter or x or facebook or youtube twitch i can see your comments and the comment stream here and if there's anything that seems relevant i'll respond to um, although you're welcome to make irrelevant comments too, that's okay. I like seeing what people, you know, saying hello from various parts of the world. It's always lovely. Um, one of the few nice things about the internet. Let's see. Um, so, to start uh, with this uh, event here, this well, maybe I, I should do some what what they call housekeeping announcements. Um, uh, this is going to be in a podcast form after I'm done, and uh, you'll be able to find it if you look for This Week with David Rovix, wherever podcasts are found, as well as at davidrovix.com slash this week. Um, and uh, it'll be on Patreon and Substack. And if you want to support the arts, uh, those are great places to do it. And um, your support is uh, very much appreciated as well as uh, needed. And... Um, yeah, so, uh, the, and, and uh, if I have a new album out called Bearing Witness, which contains uh, these sorts of songs and others, and uh, lots of songs about Gaza and the, the Holocaust being perpetrated against the people of Gaza right now. Um, and, yeah, Bearing Witness, you can find it on Bandcamp, and on May 1st it'll drop on Spotify and all the other streaming platforms. And I'll be doing a little concert tour, uh, well, in various parts of the world uh, related to the new album, as they generally are. And uh, next month, May, uh, I'll be touring in the Pacific Northwest, uh, playing in Olympia, Edmonds, Vancouver, B.C., as well as in here in Portland, Oregon. And then in June, I'll be in Australia, June, July in Australia, in August, doing a tour of the West Coast down to California, 
November, Scandinavia, and next March back in the UK, where UK Lawyers for Israel will try to get my my gigs canceled again. I just wrote a song about them this morning, which I'll post later, but it won't be part of this broadcast because I'm being specific here about the plan. And um, so, yeah, now, starting here, I have, I have a, a, I generally have a vague set of historical um, events, uh, uh, so historical forms of resistance events to talk about, and, uh, and today is no exception. I'll be uh, talking about other, um, other things, and Paula is, say, is commenting in the, ah, okay, different, great, okay. I don't have uh, the ability to do anything with this text, but um, I'm just gonna do my thing here, and um, but there will there will eventually be all sorts of commentary somewhere that that I'll be including with this um, that 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 Paula DeAngelis is is uh, typing up in a window that nobody else can see, but we'll <coughs> figure out the logistics of that. Um, I never figured out how to play guitar and do the internet simultaneously, other than, you know, what I'm doing right now. That's as much as I can handle. Um, although Pete Seeger, you know, could, could, you know, tell a story and teach people how to sing a song and sing the song all at the same time without losing the beat. I don't know how that works. I think, you know, other people have such skills, but I don't. Um, so... Anyway, now with it, with it, I've been I've been rambling for six and a half minutes without getting to the point here. Now I'm going to start getting to the point. And thanks for all of you who are um, pay, still there. Um, the uh, next week is the <clears throat> 178th um, anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Mexico, which uh, uh, took place on uh, began on April 25th, uh, 1846, and. Um, uh, it, th this is when Mexico lost most of its territory, and it was uh, ultimately, you know, forcibly annexed into the United States and became what we call now uh, places like New Mexico and Arizona and California. And um, as people who are passingly familiar with my music are aware, I wrote a song about that, uh, which is the definitely the most popular song I've written and it's called St. Patrick Battalion and it is about the the San Patricios as they're known in Mexico. Um, the mostly Irish but also lots of other folks from various other European countries as well as um, the United States and, um, who uh, formed this battalion after deserting from the U from the U.S. military and, and joining the Mexican military during the invasion and um they were one of many thousands of, of U.S. troops who deserted and moved to Mexico, but these folks uh, took that whole phenomenon of desertion uh, quite a significant step further and joined the Mexican army. And they're well-known and well-loved in, in, uh, throughout Mexico and Ireland. Um, and I have a podcast and uh, essay that I'll be coming up with in a few days uh, on this subject for for lots more on that um but the uh the particular form of resistance of course we're talking about here is uh that of um of uh of uh, treason of um you know for which they were hanged uh those who survived most of them died in battle but uh, those who survived many of them were hanged in in what was actually the biggest mass hanging in the history of the United States, although there's, uh, for those who, uh, who think that it is actually the, uh, hanging of the, uh, of the, uh, Indians in Minnesota who were involved with the uprising of, uh, Little Crow in 1862, that was a very horrendous mass hanging. That was 38 people who were hanged. And that was the biggest mass, ha mass hanging in U.S. history to occur in a single day. Uh, which is far from the biggest mass hanging to occur in uh, the history of this continent or this uh, what became the United States because in the colonial days during the pirate uh, uprising uh, there was a, a, there were bigger mass hangings um, under British rule <clears throat> but the 38 um, people who were hanged in 1862 in Minnesota were uh, 
uh, actually a, a, a smaller number than the number of people who are hanged um, after the uh, who are members of the St. Patrick Battalion. Um, although the hangings of the fifty the fifty people hanged in um, uh, after in, during the Mexican American War for being traitors. Um, were hanged over the course of three days, which is which is why it's it's often not uh, it's often overlooked as the biggest mass hanging in U.S. history. But um, you know what they did by by leaving one army and joining uh, the the opposing side uh, in in is is really one of the most extreme and and uh, you know much beloved um, acts of uh, of uh, resistance that it's possible to. Uh, to be part of, and um, it's a very, very powerful, very, very powerful symbolically as well as um, you know potentially in a you know militarily, and uh, in fact um, you know getting people to desert from the other side is a extremely important aspect of any kind of successful resistance movement. You don't uh, you know uh, salvo yourself or silo yourself or alienate people uh, in any society unless you absolutely have to fight them at that time. Otherwise, they're all uh, potential hearts and minds to be won over. And um, and that's uh, very much the case with any any army anywhere. And um, and here's a song that you can sing along to if you like. There's a St. Patrick Battalion playlist I put up on my YouTube channel, which has a whole lot of wonderful covers of this song by bands from around the world. My name is John Riley. I'll have your ear only a while. I left my dear home in Ireland. It was death, starvation, or exile. When I got to America, it was my duty to go. Enter the army and slog across Texas to join in the war against Mexico. And it was there, in the pueblos and hillsides, that I saw the mistake I had made. Part of a conquering army, with the morals of a bayonet blade. So in the midst of these poor dying Catholics, screaming children, the burning stench of it all, Myself and two hundred Irishmen decided to rise to the call. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. March neat the green flag of St. Patrick, emblazoned with Erin Goldbra. Bright with the harp and the shamrock, and the Bertad Pavre Republica. Just fifty years after Wolf Tone, five thousand miles away, the Yanks called us a legion of strangers, and they can talk as they may. But from Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied, so we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We fought them in five major battles. Churubusco was the last. Overwhelmed by the cannons from Boston, we fell after each mortar blast. Most of us died on that hillside in the service of the Mexican state. So far from our occupied homeland, we were heroes and victims of fate. From Dublin City to San Diego, we witnessed freedom denied. So we formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. We formed the St. Patrick Battalion, and we fought on the Mexican side. Um, usually I do a double chorus at the end. Sometimes I have another verse, uh, but that's uh, the way I've been doing the song. 
lately. And um, also, it's on my new album, uh, Bearing Witness. Yet another version of St. Patrick Battalion, which I can't seem to stop recording. But it's a really good one with Chet. Um, I see one song request, and I uh, or somebody commenting they like my song. Send them back. Thank you. Um, I don't know. A lot of people like that song, and some of them, a lot of them are left wingers, and a lot of them are right wingers. It's kind of interesting how that song apparently appeals to different people, um, and um, yeah. I'll just uh, leave that there. I'll talk about that some other time when we're doing songs, whatever that category would be, but that's not a song about resistance in particular. I guess it could be construed that way. I could I could construe it that way, but I won't. I'll stick to the, uh, the sort of pseudo-agenda. One of the most uh, sort of global historic rebellions that um, people outside of Australia g generally have never heard of is uh, the uh, Eureka Stockade uh, in, um, in 1854, December 1854, which um, was, uh, uh, which was a, an armed rebellion, uh, al although it um, really was, you know, in, in effect more a massacre. Um, but there were a number of British uh, troops who were killed in the process. I believe uh, six British troops and 29 uh, gold diggers and and uh, who were defending the the uh, stockade, which was just a bunch of sticks basically that they had built um, to uh, try to you know defend themselves um, from the the invasion they were expecting from the redcoats who had who were trying to collect taxes that they were not paying, um, it, that, the, that the miners uh, were not paying uh, and hadn't been paying for a while there. And they were demanding uh, you know, all sorts of reforms. And uh, uh, the, although the, the armed rebellion w was quickly put down, um, one thing historians have noted uh, that I've read is, is that a month after the massacre, uh, there was uh, most of the people of in the region, uh, the gold diggers who who at that time made up something like half the population of the state of Victoria, were um, they had a, another big protest of ten, fifteen thousand people, which is just like almost every adult, and um, and that that apparently scared the authorities to the point that ultimately by eighteen fifty six they passed. A lot of the most progressive uh, uh, thing, a lot of pro progressive labor reforms that um, have ever been passed anywhere, and um, and that's. Uh, I only heard about it when I first went to Australia, which was also the first time I figured out what the Southern Cross was. I figured that all these references to the Southern Cross had something to do with some KKK person in Alabama or whatever. I had no idea. Uh, I just, you know, didn't look these things up, you know. But then I got there and realized, oh, it's a star, it's a constellation, and you look up in the sky at night, and there it is. I just had never been to the Southern Hemisphere before, or, or well, actually, I had. I've been to Buenos Aires, but you, you don't stargaze, and, <laughs> and at least I didn't while I was there. From every corner of the world They came from all around When in 1851 They struck gold upon the ground Every voyage was a long one Month upon the stormy sea Some to seek their fortune Others escaping slavery What they found on the gold fields Was ruled by brutish thugs Discrimination and taxation Mixed with swinging billy clubs The gold was getting scarcer And cops were getting worse The diggers burned their license and vowed to end this curse They swore an oath beneath the Southern Cross They'd stand together and break the license laws From twenty different nations They gathered here as one In Ballarat beneath the Southern Sun 
crown tried to divide them, giving preference to some. And the diggers wouldn't have it. They said it's all of us or none. They built a stockade while the redcoats massed nearby. And they heard the miners shouting, we're ready now to die. The rebel miners waited for whatever lay in store. And on one December morning in 1854, the redcoats attacked the camp. Dozens there would fall among these brave gold diggers who'd risen to the call. They swore an oath beneath the Southern Cross. They'd stand together and break the license laws. From 20 different nations they gathered here as one in Ballarat beneath the Southern Sun. was over and things would go their way but when 15,000 miners rallied a month later on the day the crown conceded everything all of their demands they'd won an end to license fees the right to vote and land so here's to Joe and Charlie Lawler and the rest they drew the battle lines and put crown rule to the test the diggers may have lost the battle but they quickly won the day and those shots fired in Victoria were heard 10,000 and miles away they swore an oath beneath the Southern Cross. They'd stand together and break the license laws. From 20 different nations they gathered here as one in Ballarat beneath the Southern Sun. Another form of uh, resistance um, that uh, I've uh, mentioned before, but should be mentioned again and again, is uh, civil disobedience. Different things for different times and places, basically. It's... uh, when it comes to resistance, I would say it's not about uh, tactics being better or worse than others. It's about time and place and tactics, the combination. Um, and um, w- one of those uh, times and places where civil disobedience was a very effective tactic was during the interwar period in Denmark and many other parts of the world as well. But in Denmark, um, the syndicalist movement was uh, strong in the early 20th century, as it was in so many other parts of the world. And uh, it was basically the, the Danish equivalent of what in North, in the United States was known as the Industrial Workers of the World, and Canada as the one big union. And, and uh, in, in, I don't know what the... What the syndicalists were called in Denmark at the time actually but uh, I'm sure somebody out there does but uh, but they um, they occupied the Danish stock exchange which is particularly notable uh, this week because um, it unfortunately just burned down in a fire and it's a beautiful old building that didn't deserve to burn down in the center of Copenhagen um, but nonetheless um it was occupied by uh, the syndicalists for an entire day back in 1918. And it was a whole series of those kinds of actions that, along with a lot of other factors, resulted in the prosperity that we find in Scandinavia today. The year was 1918, the place 69 yacht by. Unemployed and hungry, gathered to ask why The bankers and stockbrokers lived like kings and queens While the ragged children starved behind the scenes Tens of thousands rallied for action to be taken 
for the state to show the poor had not been totally forsaken. When no response was coming, plans began to be arranged for the taking over of the stock exchange. The syndicalists at Folketsus were all well aware that undercover cops were everywhere. Plans were kept secret so there wouldn't be a snag. When the time came, follow the one wrapped in the red flag. Thousands followed then, knowing not what lay in store. Soon found themselves upon the exchange's floor where such ostentatious wealth cried out to be estranged from the profiteers inside the stock exchange. The stockbrokers were not harmed, but the cops were kept at bay as the floor was occupied for much of the day. The Battle of the Borso would be a story to retell. The protest and the prison time would be remembered well. They didn't overthrow the bankers, but the actions of the date led directly to reforms of the Danish welfare state. Working class prosperity no longer seemed so strange from the day the workers took the stock exchange. The year was 1918, the place 69 yacht by. I suppose there is perhaps some poetic justice in the burning down of the stock exchange, though, because it was um, the uh, it was from uh, you know the the uh, the the Folketshus, the hall the the hall of the people in Copenhagen. I mean, there's a lot of Folketshus. It's folk, it's folk you know people's houses all, all over Scandinavia. But the original Folketshus in uh, Copenhagen, as uh, far as I know, what it's the original one. I don't know. Maybe it's not. But it's one of the it's a more well known one, and certainly one of the by far the biggest ones in all of Scandinavia. Five story building uh, on 69 Jaktvai, uh in uh, the Norabro neighborhood of Copenhagen, uh, which, um, which uh, was um, the, a historic building um, where Emma Goldman spoke and Lenin spoke and, you know, all, all kinds of different things happened in the 1890s and early, early um, 1900s. Uh, eventually, the, the building fell into disrepair and uh, it, it, by 1982, it was squatted. And it became uh, the the uh, premier squat in all of Scandinavia. Really, everybody knew about this place, and it was a, it was called the House of Youth. It was you know originally called the House of the People. The Folketshus. It was it changed. They changed the name to Ungdomshus, the House of Youth. And it it was a it was a center of uh, activity in Copenhagen, and where I played many many times, um, both the old and new one. But we'll get into that some other time. Um, so. This is the building uh, that that w people marched from uh, when they went to occupy the stock exchange in 1918. They marched from Folketshus on 69 Jaktvai. They marched from there to the stock exchange, which is where they, they occupied the stock exchange, right? And uh, now the stock exchange has burned down. But um, in 2007, the uh, the the Danish authorities uh, under a fairly you know, right wing, uh, you know, by Danish standards, government. They uh, raided uh, Ungdomshuset with helicopters and hundreds of soldier, uh, you know, police, and fumigated the building with tear gas and and uh, arrested everybody inside it and uh, hired construction workers from Poland because uh, Danish ones won't work under police uh, protection. Uh, they hired pol uh, construction workers from Poland to come and destroy the building. Uh, so. Maybe it's a little poetic justice there. Uh, I don't know. I'm not Danish, so I'll let the Danes decide if that if that's the case, or if they just feel bad that a beautiful historic building, another one, has been destroyed by accident this time.
Um, I will move on to a different song um, and a different example of of resistance. Um, I'll, uh, this is a song about um, when when people are working for an empire or for a, a government as committing horrible crimes against humanity, and then they decide to um, break the rules in solidarity with the people that their government is uh, intent on killing or not saving in any case, depending, you know, what various circumstances. But yeah, it's um, a song about that kind of, uh, that kind of sacrifice, self-sacrifice to help other people, even if it might mean, uh, you know, terrible things happening to you potentially. And, um, one of the many cases where that sort of thing has happened, uh, well, there's, there's just, you know, so many, so many cases and, and some of them have been remembered in, in things like, you know, movies like Hotel Rwanda, for example, or, you know, any, lots of others. And, and then in so many, probably the overwhelming majority of, of cases, nobody's ever heard of it. You know, it was not anything that anybody made famous and, you know, maybe nobody knows other than whoever but was saved by somebody somewhere at some point. But I heard about um, Chiyune Sugihara and uh, uh, Yukiko Sugihara uh, when um, I was just uh, actually in with my wife, Reiko, in Wisconsin and um, uh, and my friend Ben Mansky, upon meeting Reiko, um, you know, made some fairly, you know, natural associations, having, you know, meeting her and realizing that, you know, I was uh, it, lovers with a woman from Japan. And um, and uh, Ben uh, recounted the story of his grandfather, Samuel Mansky, and how he survived the Nazi Holocaust uh, by... Uh, having being given a visa uh, by a, the Japanese diplomat uh, Chiyune Sugihara, Senpo Sugihara, uh, in order to uh, cross through the Soviet Union and get to um, Japan, which was how he got to China, which is how um, uh, thousands of Polish and Lithuanian and other Jews survived uh, the war by getting these visas uh, from uh, the Sugiharas. Uh, and um, and I wrote this song. He was raised in Gifu, on the islands of Japan. He was sent off to Manchuria. That's how this tale began. For his next assignment in the diplomatic corps was far off Lithuania and the European War. My grandfather was from Krakow, the Nazis came, he fled, he took his family to Vilnius, so they might not end up dead. But the Panzers were advancing, and he knew they had to go, but he had to have a visa, and all the embassies said no. There was only one final possibility, the last consulate left open the Third Reich's Asian ally. There in Lithuania, there was no time to lose. They came asking for a visa, thousands of Polish Jews. The diplomat called Tokyo, can I grant them this reprieve? Three times he got his answer, tell them all to leave. He looked into their eyes, talked to his family. He and his wife decided we must set these people free. Although I never met him, when all is said and done, I am Sugihara's son. Disobeying orders that they knew to be wrong, Senpo and Yukiko started writing all day long, a month's worth of visas in every 20-hour day. Sempo and Yukiko could turn no refugee away. Word came from the Empire, it's time to turn it in. You're closing down your consulate and moving to Berlin. 
They knew they did the right thing, of this they had no doubt. They threw visas through the window as their train pulled out. Although I never met him when all is said and done, I am Sugihara's son. My grandfather crossed Siberia for five times the normal cost. Fearing for the future with every minute lost, he got the ferry to Kobe, then to occupied Shanghai. There he spent the war years while back home his people died. Sugihara-san did not seek praise from anyone. When he died, the papers said his neighbors knew not what he'd done. But there are 40,000 people. Here now to say, although I never met him when all is said and done, I am Sugihara's son. And, um, one of the, uh, uh you know, it's kind of a, a, um, strange phenomenon of uh propaganda and and who writes the history that uh somehow or another although um the fact of the my Lai massacre was uh, one that couldn't be um hidden from the world because um it was exposed by you know journalists and others um y y you know it was originally exposed by participants who refused to participate in it which is how the journalists first heard about it and and um it's uh why we know about it and why um we, and don't know about so many other similar massacres of vietnamese women children men that have been had been committed that year and and uh so many other years during the u.s occupation of vietnam and um so you know, in retrospect now, you know, if anybody has passing familiarity with the genocidal war that the United States waged against the people of Vietnam, then, you know, they've heard about the My Lai Massacre. And perhaps they've even heard that the My Lai Massacre was standard procedure and not an exception, although probably they don't know about that and they think it's an exception to the rule, which was otherwise uh, not as brutal, which is a lie. The fact is the My Lai massacre was uh, totally standard practice. Um, but what they even are less likely to know is that the reason why they know about it in the first place was because of Hugh Thompson and, and, uh, and the uh, soldiers under his command who uh, refused to cooperate with what they saw was going on. And that's another form of resistance, a very powerful one that they don't want you to know about. But that's why the United States developed what they call Vietnam Syndrome. That's why for many years after that war, the U.S. didn't directly invade anywhere else. That's why they're so reticent to send actual troops out, you know, because they know that uh, the, these wars are not popular. And uh, they don't want to do a draft because they know that they would potentially lose the whole domestic tranquility thing if they did, you know. And they know that because of the movement of the time of, in the 60s, the, the anti-war movement, which you may know, but you're not going to be told this on the news or on uh, you know any kind of revisionist history books. That movement was led by people like Hugh Thompson. It was led by returning veterans. Thompson was a pilot, just like many more, fighting for old glory on a far-off foreign shore. He was on a lethal mission, only one of many, following his orders to kill the enemy, to kill the enemy. He 
flew low above the village, searching for the foe. When he saw a wounded child on the path below, he thought this to be a sure sign that the enemy was near. So he radioed for backup, and more choppers did appear. More choppers did appear. Help the wounded, he cried out, and beware of an attack. And then the child died by a bullet through her back. And when he looked around for the culprits of the scene, it was a company of men in U.S. military green. U.S. military green. strewn all around in this place called me Lai, which once had been a town there was a hut of huddled children soldiers had them in their sights you decided at that moment to fight for what was right to fight for what was right train your weapons on the GIs and his copter crews obeyed and stood among the children, tattered and afraid. The whole town had been murdered, but for some kids and widowed wives, and Hugh Thompson made sure that those remaining would survive. That those remaining would survive. It was a 15-minute standoff in a knee-deep sea of red, amidst the moaning of the dying and the silence of the dead. Hugh Thompson was a soldier, and he served his country well. On the day he saved the lives of a dozen kids in hell. Of a dozen kids in hell. Somebody's asking a question on YouTube about a event that took place in 1920 in Cork. Uh, and no, I had have not heard about that, but I would like to. That sounds like uh, during the Irish Civil War. And I didn't know about it, and I haven't written a song about it. But I appreciate the mention. Um... <laughs> do yeah i'll move over to iceland now um tomorrow is earth day i miss the days when earth day was like christmas it used to be like may day was christmas and earth day was christmas and now you know not really either one but uh there were uh people that well the aforementioned Ben Mansky was involved with organizing uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, the Earth Day to May Day events that uh, were, were a full week of all sorts of stuff that used to happen there. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, and uh, you know this this song that I'm about to do actually uh, took place around the same in, during the same year that Earth Day was first uh, declared as a thing in um, in when they had Earth Day events in 1970. Um, it got you know, the greenwashing and co-optation and corporate, all that stuff came later. Um, the initial initiative was a very, very good one. And, um, and it, um, in, in Iceland, um, the, the, uh, environmental movement that, that grew up there in the 1970s, um, began in a particularly unusual way with a, uh, explosion. And, um, it's a story that uh, is really, um, I think, um, particularly powerful, poignant, uh, particularly if you're like me and you know a lot of people who spent a long time in prison for 
uh, Earth Liberation Front activities. My good friend Marius Mason is still in prison today after, you know, I guess he's going to be in prison for more than 20 years before he's finally let out. Um, and uh, the, he got this sentence for doing exactly the same sorts of things that these farmers in Iceland did, none of whom went to prison for what they did. And um, I think the key difference here is not necessarily that they committed uh, acts involving explosives um, uh, for an environmental cause. Um, it, 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 in that way, what they did was so similar to what Earth Liberation Front has done in so many places. But um, uh, the difference was they all took a responsibility for it and uh, said and dared the authorities to arrest everybody who took responsibility for it. <laughs> Beside a volcano and the rising ash, a crystal river rushing past, a crystal river flowing free, now again like it used to be. Since now the dam is out of sight, blown apart by dynamite, blown apart by everyone in the land of the midnight sun. A hundred farmers the next day called the cops so they could say if you're looking for one to blame a hundred farmers gave their names gave their names said it was i who couldn't just stand idly by we all knew that sometimes you must commit a crime there was a blast, a booming sound, and the dam came crashing down. In Reykjavik, voices shrill said the dam should be bigger still. By the Loxa Riverside, a hundred farms would be washed aside. Legal efforts and protests failed, but they still had air behind their sails. They had air and dynamite, so they gathered round late one night. There was a blast, a booming sound, and the dam came crashing down. Prosecutors tried to choose which farmers had lit the fuse, but not a one would tell the tale, and not one farmer went to jail. The dam was never built again, and many still remember when. By the Loxa River they set things right with a couple sticks of dynamite. There was a blast, a booming sound, and the dam came crashing down. There was a blast, a booming sound, and the dam came crashing down. Oh, well, somebody, Henka, just mentioned East Tennessee, and I didn't think about including that one, but that is a very appropriate one to include, so we will just now include it. And uh, it's also from a similar time period. The dam was blown up in 1970. Uh, th what, what this song is written about uh, are events that took place in 1968, I was in Tennessee a long time ago visiting um, f various folks, including my friend Chris Irwin, who is an environmental lawyer and longtime radio uh, programmer and, and environmental activist. Um, and uh, Chris had some articles about what went on in 68 in Tennessee, in, in that part of Tennessee, and then also over the border in Kentucky, um, which involved some 
seriously massive um, explosions, uh, sabotage uh, that were carried out against the uh, operations, the strip mine operations that were very unpopular for lots of locals who didn't, didn't want to see uh, this form of mining just completely destroying everything around. Um, and, um, you know, they took matters into their own hands. And in the case of these massive explosions in Tennessee and in Kentucky, nobody ever got caught. And I love those kinds of stories. Um, nobody took credit, but nobody got caught, which is, you know. And um, I just, um, after reading those articles that Chris shared with me, I wrote this song uh, just imagining, you know, who did it. Just taking a guess. I grew up on this mountain, came back here to dwell. Maybe have a family, plant some corn and dig a well. I was all done with the army back from Vietnam where I learned how to hold a rifle and how to set a bomb. I grew up on this mountain. It's in my very soul. So when the company moved next door, started digging for the coal, tearing up the mountain with drillers and drag lines, I knew then what needed to happen to those mines. Sometimes that's just how it goes. Three, two, one, get out before it blows. The guard, he was sleeping on duty through the night. I stepped gently on the ground, stayed well out of sight. I tied sticks to the equipment, switched the timer on, and I knew that in 10 seconds those dozers would be gone. 10, 9, 8, sometimes that's just how it goes. 3, 2, 1, get out before it blows. to the west the cops were on my trail and i figured it was best and i figured i did my small part to make the world free in my humble manner in east tennessee ten nine eight sometimes that's just how it goes three two one get out before it blows <laughs> My voice got lower since I wrote that song, and I got to remember to do that key, to lower the key. This is happening to everybody. I, all the all the male, well, I, probably female too. I, I, I guess it's happened to everybody. All the songwriters, their voices lower over time. Christy Moore, it's very evident. Uh, he's, he's really uh, much lower. Jim Page as well. Jim, I told Jim his lo voice is lower, and he said, I'm next, so I guess that's true. He's like 20 years older than me. Uh, Leonard Cohen is still the songwriter whose lowering voice was best uh, used, uh, I think. He, he just completely changed his whole style, and uh, um, that was that was really good. Um Do, do it. Somebody's asking if I take care of good care of my voice. Uh, um, I don't know. It depends. I mean, my my stepmother is an opera singer, and so I'm familiar with uh, the whole concept of what people mean by taking care of your voice. But uh, I think uh, the way, like 
Bob Dylan and Aretha Franklin have taken care of their voices has been by smoking two packs a day. And, I, you know, it seems to have done both of them uh, great wonders. I, but, you know, I, I avoid that not because of my because it would be bad for my voice, but because it would be bad for my lifespan. But I guess, you know, it depends what kind of voice you want. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. The answer is no, I don't take care of my voice. I just sing. And I, and I don't find there's any need to take care of my voice beyond just like, you know, eating well and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's probably, I'm not sure if it's, yeah, I don't know if it's different from uh, other forms of taking care of yourself. Like, I mean, if I, like when I used to do karate, you, you know, I would stretch before doing it and that was important. But then, you know, I'm not singing opera, so I don't feel like there's any benefit in doing vocal exercises before I sing songs. It's just not like that kind of music that requires, you know, that kind of care for your voice. So anyway, um, lovely question. All questions are. And um, I appreciate you guys listening out there in the world, wherever you've been. And um, there's lots of more ground to cover, but we're going to cover one more song in this particular session and um and i guess this is a song about the so about songs it's a song about songs it's a song i wrote about how a song could have an impact on the world and um there's actually a lot of examples of songs that have directly impacted um the world uh, through their existence um and i will not get into examples of them right now and it might be a little difficult to, uh, you know, say which ones for sure have had a big impact and which ones haven't. Um, but uh, I think we, we, we can definitely talk about that. But I won't. I'll just sing this song and bid you all a good day. And um, and and once again, um, if anybody is in the Pacific Northwest, I'll be playing in Portland and uh, Edmonds near Seattle and Olympia and Vancouver, B.C. next month. And I'll be in Australia in June and July, California in August, Scandinavia in November, and the UK, hopefully Ireland, uh, in March 25. And uh, I'd love to hear from anybody who might want to book a gig any of those places, because that's how this works. It's a very crowdsourced phenomenon when it works, and um, so is my general survival. So if anybody has disposable income and wants to keep me going uh, and keep the rent uh, paid and keep me having time to write songs and record and do all this, which I spend most of my time doing, um, you know, I'm on Patreon and I'm on Substack and your support is both appreciated and essential. And with that, uh, one more song, this one um, about songs and particularly about the genocide in Gaza, which is very related, as everything is. If a song could bring us together across the planet that gave us birth to act as one bring peace and justice all around this shattered earth If a song could take down borders take down fences make them fall liberate all those imprisoned, kept behind the ghetto walls. If a song could stop the bombs, so the next might be the last. If a song could change the future, so it won't be like the past. If a song could be a missile fired from the Iron Dome. If it could protect the children, keep them safe within their homes. If a song could raise an army and transport it on command, take us all to Palestine to defend 
the Holy Land. If a song could be concrete and put to use to rebuild, if it might turn back the clock, bring back all the babies killed. If a song could be a blueprint, instructions to show us how. If a song could change the world, then let us sing it now. If a song could bring us together across the planet that gave us birth, act as one, bring peace and justice all around this shattered earth. Take care, everybody. Keep on keeping on.